Hello, viewers, and welcome to yet another Warhammer 40,000 Conquest video production. My name is Mitch, and I am the Hive Tyrant. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the non-signature cards for the Space Marines faction that were included within the core set. In this video, I'm only going to be discussing card combinations and synergy in the context of the core set alone, but in later videos, I'll be reviewing each and every one of this game's released and upcoming War Packs and Deluxe Expansions. Although this video is going to focus on card analysis from the perspective of a Space Marines player, I'll nevertheless touch on any synergy with the Space Marines Loyal Tau and Astra Militarum Allied cards when appropriate. Although I'm sure to miss some uses for these cards over the course of the video, be sure to mention your personal favorites in the comments below. But with that said, let's kick things off with the first of our Space Marines Army Units. First up, we have the 10th Company Scout, a one-cost unit with the Scout and Ultramarines traits, one command icon, two attack value, and one hit point. And worth noting is that since this is only the core set, many of the traits that we're going to be seeing throughout this video, such as Scout and Ultramarines, really all the different Space Marines chapters amongst many other traits, don't actually have any gameplay effects yet. But as we see more and more expansions for this game, there's likely to be all the more reason to go back and pay attention to some of these older cards that could nevertheless resurface to prominence based upon their having now valuable traits. But in any case, this is a very cheap, relatively versatile Space Marines unit. It's hard to beat that single resource token cost. It has a command icon so that you can deploy this onto any single planet, and it can threaten enemy rogue traders or void pirates. It's really able to fill multiple roles in that particularly if you have that initiative token, it can do some respectable damage despite being a rather frail and vulnerable unit. If you can attack first, you can hit for a couple points of damage. If it just so happens that it's a very low value target for your opponent, later in the game, once you have multiple units on one planet, it's potentially likely to be able to attack multiple times. It doesn't have any ability, so it's certainly not doing anything very exciting, and like I mentioned before, seeing as how it does have that single hit point, it makes it particularly vulnerable to area effect units, as well as global damage, or even direct damage effects, like Captain Cato Sicarius' own signature army unit, Sicarius' Chosen, or perhaps a Chaos player Zinch's Firestorm, or an orc weird boy maniac, there are a lot of enemy cards that provide a hard counter to this bread and butter style vanilla space marine, but for that cost, it's really hard to go wrong. Any number of attachments could make this guy all the stronger, and if it just so happens that you're allied with the Astra Militarum, although it doesn't hit the hardest, if you're able to leverage a Katachan outpost opportunistically in your favor, in being able to potentially hit for four, this Ultramarine Scout nevertheless has the possibility of packing a hell of a punch. But on to a much more interesting army unit, we have the three cost Blood Angels Veterans. Also with one command icon, but three attack value and three hit points, it has the Soldier and Blood Angels traits, and while this unit is ready, it gains reaction. After this unit is assigned damage, prevent one of that damage. So, in any kind of situation where you can force your opponent to attack this multiple times, possibly if they're trying to take advantage of multiple low attack value token units, 
like snotlings, cultists, or guardsmen, you can trigger that reaction multiple times, although important to note is that as soon as Blood Angel's veterans becomes exhausted, which typically occurs when it has its opportunity to attack, you no longer benefit from that ability. So although your opponent certainly won't always choose to attack this unit, particularly if it is ready and ready to leverage its ability in your favor, if you can force your opponent into a situation where they have to attack it repeatedly, possibly if you deploy this in the early game alone to the first planet, you can nevertheless give that ability a pretty significant workout. Particularly if you don't end up with the initiative token, even though that normally isn't the most desirable of circumstances, if at the start of every round of combat you're sitting there ready and unexhausted, over the course of an entire battle you can potentially save yourself from taking a lot of damage, particularly if you can bolster that pool of hit points with any number of attachments, such as the Astra Militarum Hostile Environment Gear or some of the Space Marine attachments we'll be covering later in this video. As it does happen to have that soldier trait, this could be put to possibly even better use if played alongside Colonel Strachan, just because it paints it out to be all the better target for your enemy in suddenly having an attack value of 4. And, if you are running a lot of Astra Militarum cards, if this does happen to leave play, as with any of these Space Marine Army units, the Elysian Assault Team is the perfect answer to your opponent destroying one of your units, so that hopefully not only can that interplay, but also dish out some damage in response to your enemy. And if you are running an Astra Militarum Warlord, whether it's Colonel Strachan or any other, being able to attach Bodyguard to this unit can make it all the better, in that particularly if you're able to boost its hit points, not only is it a very unpleasant unit to attack, but having that big pool of HP, it could nevertheless absorb quite a bit of punishment from some of your more vulnerable and fragile potentially harder-hitting and higher-priority target units. I think one of the most important things to keep in mind about this ability is that it occurs whenever this unit takes damage, not only damage from an attack. So whether it's area effect, whether it's some sort of direct damage event, or even if it happens to be something like Armor Bane, at the very least you can soak a single point of damage at least so long as your opponent isn't able to take advantage of this unit being exhausted. So if you're running up against an Eldar player, possibly using Eldarath, or maybe even a Shrouded Harlequin, any kind of effect, even just exhausting to attack, leaves this Blood Angel's veterans just as exposed as any other three hit point units. But, nevertheless, having no limit to how many times you can trigger this ability per round, given that it has one command icon and fares very well during individual skirmishes, this nevertheless strikes me as a very strong unit and is sure to see play in a tremendous number of decks. But on to a more expensive unit, we have the Daring Assault Squad, with a cost of 4, also one Command Icon, also a Soldier and Blood Angels, with 3 attack value and 3 hit points, but it instead has Area Effect 2. So... Also very effective against token units in particular, although in a purely offensive sense as opposed to defensive, this has the extraordinarily potent potential of clearing a planet of low hit point enemy army units, such as Tau, Eldar, and Dark Eldar. There are innumerable different army units with two or fewer hit points that can be absolutely decimated by even a single area effect volley. 
but in addition to that potent ability, it also has pretty reasonable stats. Three attack value allows it to dish out some significant serious damage, and having three hit points makes it at least resilient enough to take an attack or two from a vanilla and unabetted enemy warlord. You can compare it pretty closely to the Astra Militarum vehicular alternative, the Mordian Hellhound, and while it does have fewer command icons, it nevertheless hits a hell of a lot harder in an area effect situation. Plus, this is yet another Space Marines unit that might be absolutely fantastic if played alongside Colonel Strachan. And in that case, being able to bump its base attack power up to 4 makes it much more threatening against single, survivable, durable, and resilient enemy army units or their warlord. While this certainly is an expensive unit, it nevertheless has the potential to deal out enormous amounts of damage, possibly destroy multiple enemy units each and every combat round if your opponent isn't able to destroy it, or route it, or leverage any number of card effects against it, and if it just so happens that you're playing Tau, by affixing a copy of Gun Drones to this unit, it's boosted up to Area Effect 4, which can decimate and outright destroy all but the hardiest and most expensive of enemy units. Taken all together, although in many cases strictly weaker than the Blood Angels veterans in a mono -a mono one-on-one -on -one type combat context, this card has absolutely fantastic potential, and it seems all but a certain inclusion in almost any deck. Next, as expense continues to rise, we have the Deathwing Guard, a 5-cost army unit with an immense 4 command icons, the Soldier, Dark Angels, and Elite traits, with 2 attack value and a staggering 9 hit points, but important to note, also a Loyal icon. So, despite the obvious expense, this unit has an enormous pool of hit points, and given that tremendous command icon value, simply putting this on a planet all but guarantees you're going to be winning a command struggle. And even if your opponent tries to challenge you for that planet, being able to soak up so much damage, even though your attack value is relatively low, you're nevertheless likely to survive and and over the course of multiple rounds of combat, potentially deal out a serious amount of damage in return to your enemy, or potentially kill a small number of relatively fragile units. Largely because this unit is so durable, it's an absolutely fantastic target to stick attachments to, like the Tau Ion Rifle, which would bring its attack value up to 5, and it's an absolutely fantastic candidate to pair with the Honored Librarian unit that we'll cover in greater detail in just a few minutes. Despite its lofty expense, this unit does nevertheless have enormous stats for you to manipulate to your benefit, and although by itself it might not change the outcome of the game, it's certainly a fantastic platform to host or complement any number of other cards and effects. As one final note about the Deathwing Guard, I'll just mention that as with any elite army, this 9 hit point mountain, if it ever happens to be destroyed, can be returned to play at your HQ if you choose to trigger the Fall Back event, and, by merit of having that elite trait, it also makes it immune to the Loyal Tau event Deception. So that if you do end up investing that lofty 5 resources through either Fall Back or through preventing your opponent from triggering Deception, this investment is nevertheless a little bit better protected. But moving right along, our next army unit is the Eager Recruit, with a cost of 1, the Scout and Ultramarines traits, an attack value of 2, a hit point value of 1, and the keyword Ambush. 
So strikingly similar in statistics and cost to our 10th company scouts, this unit swaps a command icon for that ambush keyword. So instead of potentially winning command struggles for you, this unit allows you the somewhat unique ability to play it during the combat round, potentially when your opponent's expecting it the least, and when you're able to damage him or her the most. Given that this unit is exceptionally fragile, seeing as how it only has that single hit point, you can use action windows in your favor to make sure that this hits the board right after your opponent has spent their final attack, so that you can get in at least one attack in return, and if you possess the initiative token, you might have the potential of including a second two attack value attack before your opponent can destroy this guy. This certainly allows the Space Marine player a chance for some opportunistic kills, but as opposed to some sort of event that might deal damage directly, if you do manage to kill an enemy unit, you very well might be left with an eager recruit sitting at that planet, ready to participate in later battles. One particularly sneaky trick that you might be able to pull with either this or any ambush unit is if during the combat phase your opponent hasn't dedicated any units to the first planet, instead of just allowing it to disappear into the void, you can use action windows prior to any battle occurs in order to sneakily deploy this onto the first planet and not only steal it into your victory display, but also trigger that planet's battle ability if it happens to be beneficial to you. Again, as with any other army unit, this sneak attack gets all the more powerful if you can surprise your opponent with not just deploying this army unit, but also by boosting its attack with a Katachan outpost, and if you happen to be running Fire Warrior Elites, your opponent might have a lot of hit points to chew through before it can one-hit kill this, under normal circumstances, extremely fragile unit. So, while looking at its statistics alone, it doesn't necessarily give the immediate appearance of a powerhouse, it nevertheless has fantastic potential, and for that rock-bottom cost, it's hard to go wrong with this card. As I mentioned earlier, next we have the Honored Librarian, a three-cost unit with one command icon, the Psyker and Ultramarine's traits, a loyal icon, four attack value and two hit points, and the oh-so-important text, enemy units cannot attack this unit while you control a unit not named Honored Librarian at this planet. So, with a significant base attack value, this unit can at times feel absolutely invincible, in that so long as your opponent doesn't have any number of events or abilities or area effect or that kind of thing to leverage against you, it can be exceedingly difficult to target with enemy attacks. Specifically, so long as you happen to have any other unit at its location, ranging from the lowly 10th Company Scout to your Warlord to the enormously tanky Deathwing Guard, even a single other unit under your control sitting at the same planet as the Honored Librarian utterly prevents your opponent from attacking it at all. And if it just so happens that it is sitting at a planet with a particularly durable and resilient unit, unless your opponent has a particularly hard-hitting unit sitting there to respond, or some sort of direct counter in the form of Zinch's Firestorm or any other effect, Combat round after combat round, this librarian has the possibility of dealing out absolutely ridiculous amounts of damage, particularly if you do enhance its already significant base attack value with attachments like Ion Rifle, being able to take multiple shots for an enormous 7 damage can absolutely decimate all but the absolute hardiest of enemy units. Even if you don't have the resources to invest in the Deathwing Guard or another hardy unit, 
having this unit commit to a planet with your warlord, even though it arrives during that first round of combat exhausted, it could nevertheless prove immensely difficult for your opponent to deal with. Seeing as how it can be exceptionally difficult for your opponent to work through your warlord, and as we'll see throughout this video, the Space Marines faction in particular has access to a host of different effects that can make that seem all but impossible, the Honored Librarian cannot just be an enormous boon to your half of the battlefield, but outright alter the outcome or trajectory of a game. It even benefits from tricks like being able to ambush an eager recruit into play, so just at the moment where your opponent thinks they've finally destroyed each and every other army unit, and they can finally target your librarian with conventional attacks, so long as you can use events or ambush units to keep putting units onto the table, you can continually stave off your opponent being able to respond to this unit. Although it is certainly weak to moving damage, direct damage, exhaustion, routing, and similar effects, particularly if you're saving shield cards for this unit, it nevertheless has enormous potential, and I can scarcely say enough good things about this unit. Especially considering that later we're going to be covering a vehicle that can prevent this unit from being targeted by enemy events, even though it seems frail with that two hit points, it can nevertheless persist turn after turn, providing an enormous headache for your enemy. But moving right along, our next army unit has much more of a focus on the command phase. It's the Iron Hands Tech Marine, with a cost of three, one command icon, the Soldier and Iron Hands traits, one attack value, and a pool of three hit points. Its text reads, this unit gains one command icon for each enemy unit at this planet. So, while it certainly can't dish out nearly as much damage as our previous unit, it nevertheless has a reasonable pool of hit points and the potential to gain an enormous number of command icons. Important to note is that this unit is not loyal, and played under the command of Colonel Strachan, it has a base 2 attack value which, in addition to making it a valuable command unit, makes it relatively reasonable to employ in a combat situation as well. This is potentially fantastic to help you contest command struggles, just because for each and every unit that your opponent deploys at this planet, whether they happen to be warlords, tokens, or armies, each and every one gives you an additional command icon. And unless all of your opponent's units possess command icons of their own, or potentially more than one, it can be difficult for your opponent to break even with you, let alone actually win a command struggle. And for that reason, that makes this a potentially excellent card when it comes to not only generating cards and resources for yourself, but denying those to your opponent. This unit is probably best when placed at a planet where you really need something. Whether you're really needing resources to trigger some sort of event during the combat phase, or whether you really need to fish for cards to draw something that's going to save you from some sort of dire or desperate circumstance, Although it takes a bit of work at times, this unit does nevertheless have some decent potential. It certainly can seem a little expensive at times, especially compared to some of the other Space Marines units we've already covered, and if it just so happens to get caught up in your Warlord's retinue, unless it's being deployed alongside your Warlord to a planet where there's also the enemy Warlord, it doesn't really matter how many command icons you have, seeing as how your warlord wins command struggles automatically. I've already mentioned a number of different effects that can help to bolster its relatively mundane attack value, but with hopefully scarce exceptions, you're much more likely to be relying on other army units to be winning battles for you. 
all the same, having that three hit points does mean that it might have an opportunity to retreat if it just so happens to get ambushed by your opponent. So, even though this doesn't necessarily strike me as an auto-include in a Tau, Space Marines, or Astra Militarum deck, I do think it's nevertheless worthy of consideration. And moving ever on, next we have the Land Raider, a 5 cost vehicle, tank, and elite unit with 3 command icons, 3 attack value, and a rather respectable pool of 7 hit points. It has no war gear attachments, and non vehicle units you control at this planet cannot be targeted by enemy card abilities. So for that reason, beyond that enormous pool of hit points, it goes absolutely fantastic paired with your Honored Librarian, because until your opponent can work through that 7 HP, you're not only able to return fire with your hardy and resilient Land Raider, but that far more fragile, nevertheless base attack value 4 army unit as well. Although it itself doesn't have the highest attack value, it's nevertheless likely to survive at least one round of combat, so if it does happen to get caught up in traveling from planet to planet with your Warlord, you're likely to not only benefit from it denying enemy card abilities, but it's also quite likely to be readied after that initial round of combat. The ability to make any of your other army units at that planet immune to direct targeting effects like Archon's Terror or Zinch's Firestorm can be absolutely invaluable, and even though it itself is an eligible target for many enemy card abilities, having that big base hit point value, it's nevertheless often going to prove to be a very poor choice for Zinch's Firestorm and other direct damage type effects. It is, however, very important to note that it itself is just as vulnerable as a normal unit to any number of different effects, ranging from routing via Archon's Terror to exhausting from Eldorath, any number of different card abilities nevertheless have the chance of not just removing this unit from its current planets, but potentially from play entirely. And although it has that elite keyword, making it immune to deception and targetable by fallback, if your opponent does manage to shift your land raider out of the way, any of your other units at that planet suddenly become vulnerable, and always keep in mind that this confers no protection whatsoever against global type effects. So area effect punishes units all the same as it ever would, as do enemy card effects without any specific target, ranging from an enemy's exterminatus or doom to a chaos player's warp storm. So, for all those reasons and more, while the Land Raider can certainly make a potent ally, it's by no means invulnerable or indestructible, and it's always good to be aware of exactly what kind of cards your opponent might be able to leverage against you, just to absolutely minimize your chances of being taken by surprise. And next up we have yet another vehicle in the 4 cost Raven Guard Speeder, with the vehicle and Raven Guard traits, with 2 command icons, 3 attack value, and 3 hit points. It has the No War Gear Attachments clause, as well as the Flying Keyword, which results in it taking only half damage, rounded up, from the attacks of non-flying enemy units. So, although it is expensive, if it just so happens that you deploy this unit to a planet alone, you can rest relatively confident that you're not only likely to tie or possibly win a command struggle, but if this unit just so happens to find itself forced into a combat situation, at the very least you're likely to survive long enough to retreat, and quite possibly you can deal out some significant damage to your opponent in return. 
but this just might happen to be one of the less appealing units we've covered so far, just because typically players have access to harder hitting units for cheaper, or particularly a Space Marines player, has different opportunities to make use of less expensive units that are nevertheless more or differently durable in their own sense, like the Honored Librarian that's difficult to pin down, or the Blood Angel's Veteran, which can repeatedly mitigate any assigned damage. This compares largely unfavorable to the Astra Militarum Assault Valkyrie, which for the same cost has one greater attack value and one higher hit point, although it has different traits and one fewer command icon. All the same, given that three hit points isn't a tremendous number, and that flying doesn't allow you to dodge area effect damage, despite doing well against conventional attacks, the Raven Guard Speeder nevertheless strikes me as a relatively vulnerable target given its cost. For one additional resource token, the Deathwing Guard, although they do not fly, have triple the pool of hit points and double the command icons, even though they aren't able to hit quite so hard. But they have the added benefit of being the recipient of war gear, so for all those reasons and more, Regarding non-loyal army units, Raven Guard Speeder strikes me as largely skippable. But, on to what's certain to be more of a linchpin in a Space Marines, Astra Militarum, or Tau deck, we have the two-cost Tactical Squad Cardenas. With one command icon, the Soldier and Ultramarines traits, one attack value, three hit points, and area effect one. So, for an exceptionally cheap cost, you can nevertheless deploy a unit that can leverage a potentially potent area effect volley in your favor. Even though one damage may not seem like much, it can nevertheless punish if not outright decimate an opponent that deploys a large number of low hit point army or token units against you. In the very early game, if it happens to run up against a void pirate or rogue trader with the enemy warlord, you can trigger that volley of area effect to not only potentially kill that unit, but also inflict a point of damage to their warlord and unless they're willing to be very free with shield icons, this unit, although it does have a very low base attack value, can nevertheless distribute a large number of damage to any opposing enemy army. For half the cost of a daring assault squad, you nevertheless might derive 100% of the area effect benefit. Just because if it's one damage or two, unless your opponent is willing to spend shield cards, you might nevertheless be able to decimate the ranks of a swarm of chimera, snotlings, or any number of other fragile enemies. Plus, if you happen to play this alongside Colonel Strachan, having the soldier trait, it can attack in a conventional sense for two, and seeing as how it has three hit points, it's at the very least able to survive at least a single swing from even the strongest unbuffed enemy warlords. But beyond everything I've already mentioned, it has the additional benefit of possessing a command icon, so if you're looking for a means of harassing low hit point, likely to be command icon heavy enemy units like the Eldar Survivalist or any number of others, you don't have to look any further than this tactical squad, and beyond that early game benefit, it could make an enormous difference on the outcome of the game if used near the middle or end just to deal that final blow to any number of enemy units. It certainly might not seem to be much of a powerhouse in a one-on-one -on -one type sense, but its potential for harassment and the possibility of wiping your opponent's board nevertheless makes this an immensely appealing army. And, last but not least of our non-unique Space Marines faction army units, we have the six-cost 
Ultramarines Dreadnought. With the vehicle, Ultramarines, and Elite Traits, an incredible 8 attack value, and a seemingly insurmountable 8 hit points. Quite simply, its text box reads, No War Gear Attachments. So, despite being staggeringly expensive at 6, it's nevertheless capable of dealing an incredible amount of damage to powerful enemy units. Even if they happen to be holding on to 2 or 3 value shield cards to help mitigate some of the harm, that can nevertheless prove to be an absolutely overwhelming amount of damage tokens that you can dump onto some of their hardiest, most valuable, or resilient units. And given just how high that attack value is, under most circumstances, it becomes absolutely trivial to bloody or kill an opponent's warlord unless they can leverage some sort of card effect against you to stop it. Although the Dreadnought doesn't possess any inherent ability, and the fact that you can't attach war gear to it actually serves as a detriment, it nevertheless does, in some sense, dodge effects like Twisted Laboratory that would otherwise eliminate some enormously beneficial effect, like that of the Land Raider. Obviously, this unit is an absolute powerhouse, and so long as you can get it into a battle, it's going to absolutely devastate your opponent. At the very least, it can take an enormous amount of punishment before your opponent is able to destroy it. Even deployed alongside your Warlord, given that it arrives exhausted, it's all but certain to survive the first round of combat in order to ready and start seriously bringing the pain to your opponents. The problem inherent to this unit, as with so many other expensive armies, is that it's very vulnerable to cards like Archon's Terror, which can allow your opponent for a mere fraction of this unit's cost to eliminate it from a battle entirely. And of course, by merit of having no command icons, this unit does absolutely nothing for you during the command phase. Also worth considering is that if you just so happen to be unfortunate enough to be running up against an Eldrath Starbane employing Eldar player, the ease with which your opponent can exhaust this unit might be absolutely maddening. And although this loyal unit certainly has enormous potential, I think you're very likely to find it all but impossible to run into situations where you're really getting the most out of your resources invested in this unit. Given that in many situations you might not have any better target than a Chimera token to direct that normally enormous 8 attack value toward, while the Ultramarine's Dreadnought nevertheless has the potential of devastating your opponent, I think it might be much more likely to simply hit the table and flounder. But the final Space Marines army, and the first of our unique units, is Veteran Brother Maxos. With a cost of three, two command icons, the Soldier and Ultramarines traits, a Loyal icon, two attack value, three hit points, and the text combat action. Pay the printed cost of a Space Marines unit in your hand to put it into play at this planet. So, for all the same reasons that I liked the eager recruit, I also like veteran brother Maxos, in that his action effectively grants the ambush keyword to any Space Marines unit that you happen to have in your hand. So even though you're certainly going to get more resilience or combat prowess out of an equivalently costed non-unique Space Marines unit, his ability does wonders to add an enormous element of surprise when it comes to your opponent trying to predict what you might be doing with your resources during the combat phase. His ability does not require him to exhaust, it does not have any limit, and for that reason, your opponent may be far too afraid to bother deploying units at his planets, which might just end up giving you a free command struggle win at that location. 
seeing as how what you can play is going to vary tremendously based on how many resource tokens you have and how many cards are in your hand, this unit has tremendous psychological value, even if by himself he might not make a huge difference over the course of one individual battle. But being able to leverage that ability in your favor can be absolutely fantastic, and at the very least, if you can wait to deploy units until the deployment phase has passed, you have all the more information available to you, and that your opponent will have had to give up any opportunity to play deploy actions against units that you've played during the subsequent combat phase. For instance, cards like Deception or Exterminatus, even if you dump a ton of units onto the table during combat, your opponent no longer possesses an eligible attack window with which to leverage any of those effects against you. While it is possible that waiting to trigger his ability could backfire, such as a Chaos player triggering a Zinch's Firestorm to destroy him before he gets the ability to trigger his action, so long as you know your opponent and plan ahead, you can ultimately derive an enormous benefit from this character. And, simply by merit of his having that unique tag, he's able to exhaust for you to play No Mercy in order to cancel what could prove to be an absolutely critical shield card of your opponent. And although that does require him to exhaust, again, that's utterly unnecessary to make use of his ability. Really, the last thing I can think of to mention for Veteran Brother Maxos is... Even though he does have a potentially enormously powerful ability, keep in mind that that results in your putting units into play, as opposed to deploying them. And as the Space Marines, as do so many other factions, possess a support that can reduce the cost of deployed units, that ability unfortunately does not give you the opportunity to trigger that effect. Now, with veteran brother Maxos covered, that brings us to an end of our army units. Next up, to round out the core set Space Marine roster, we have a pair of attachments, the first of which is the Godwin Pattern Bolter, with a cost of one, one shield icon, the war gear and weapon traits, and the text attached to an army unit. Attached unit gets plus one attack, plus one hit points, and, while it is attacking, ignores the flying keyword on enemy units. So, although this attachment's most potentially devastating effect is very situational, particularly considering the relative scarcity of flying units for a very low cost and the flexibility of offering a shield icon, this is nevertheless a reasonable, useful attachment. There's hardly any situation where having an additional point of attack and HP doesn't help the attached units, and if at any point in the future we start seeing a prevalence of flying unit heavy decks, this would be a fantastic response to that change in the meta. Important to note is that this has the war gear trait, which means that it's ineligible for attachment to almost any vehicle unit, but simply by merit of being an attachment, that alone confers a small number of beneficial effects. So just like an elite unit is immune to deception, any unit that you attach this bolter or any other attachment to suddenly suffers no damage from Warp Storm. And if you do happen to frequently find yourself running up against Chaos Faction players, particularly those that like to employ the enormously durable and insurmountably hard-hitting Black Legion Helldrake, in conjunction with a Tau Ion Rifle, this could nevertheless allow you the opportunity to devastate even the most hardy and resilient of enemy units. 
Plus, at the very least, it alters what can at times in this game be the relatively simple math of combat. Particularly if you're the one holding the initiative token, the difference between leaving an enemy unit alive with one hit point or dead with zero can have an enormous effect on the outcome of not only one battle, but potentially the entire game. This is probably its very best when affixed to one of the scarcely few ranged attackers that a Space Marines player has access to, namely the Astra Militarum Rattling Deadeye and the Tau Stingwing Swarm and Viorla Marksman, but it might also be put to pretty fantastic use on a stalwart Ogren, just because units with attachments always become bigger targets for your enemy, and by affixing this to a unit that's immune to events, suddenly your opponent might no longer be able to leverage effects like Archon's Terror against you. If at any point you find yourself desperate to dig for this attachment, certainly it's yet another that the Earthcast Technician can retrieve, and I think not only the Blood Angels veterans, but also the Honored Librarian are fantastic targets for this attachment. The former because it not only hits all the harder, but also has all the more opportunities to soak up damage, and the latter because it's not only saved from Warp Storm and less vulnerable to area effect, but can pack all the more devastating a punch and, particularly when combined with any number of other attack bolstering effects, can one hit kill the enemy warlord or any unit they might dare to pit against you. It's often difficult to find an army unit that does not benefit from an attachment, but it's still always a good idea to try and derive the utmost out of these cards. And something else, like a Fire Warrior Strike Team, might also make a fantastic target, in that it not only derives the benefit inherent to this attachment, but it also gains an additional point of attack power to boost, making it into at least a 3-6 army unit that's not only hardy, but also possesses a very respectable attack value. So for all of those reasons and more, I think the Godwin Pattern Bolter is definitely a card to keep an eye on, and whether or not you decide to include this in any decks now, it's certainly always one to think about for the future. But next, our second and final Space Marine attachment is the Iron Halo. With a cost of three, two shield icons, and a loyal icon. It has the Relic and War Gear traits and reads, Limit one Relic per player. Attach to a unique unit. Reaction. After attached unit is assigned damage by an attack, exhaust this attachment to prevent all of that damage. So, beyond that obvious, powerful two shield value, for a relatively steep expense, you nevertheless can prevent, once per full game round, all damage from a single attack to attached unique units. And although that sounds good, this does have several important built-in limitations. Specifically that the Space Marine Warlords we're currently aware of have powerful relics, each their own, included within their signature squad. And beyond that restriction, this can only be affixed to a unique unit. And within the core set, the only non-Warlord Space Marines option, considering that this is a loyal card, is Veteran Brother Maxos. And although it is great in theory to keep him alive, so that you can repeatedly trigger his at times invaluable combat action, investing six resources into that one unit, only to have him fall prey to any number of wicked events or tricky enemy abilities could be absolutely tragic and result in an enormous waste of your resources. Also important to consider is that even though you can absorb one full attack in its entirety, 
though in the ideal situation it's something like a Black Legion Helldrake or Ultramarine's Dreadnought, each attacking for eight respectively. If the alternative happens and you find yourself running up against multiple enemy units, something like a swarm of Snotlings or Chimera tokens, or simply multiple medium cost moderate attack value units, as soon as you're taking multiple attacks, you can only eliminate one of those. And veteran brother Maxos specifically has nothing close to the enormous pool of hit points we see on most warlords. But this attachment does nevertheless allow you to be much more reckless in employing your warlord into the thick of combat. You can be much more careless, and even if you do happen to make an occasional mistake, this could nevertheless prove all the difference in sparing your warlord a bloodying, or allowing you to dispatch all the more enemy units in direct combat with your commander. But regardless, this is certainly a card that's only going to increase in value and versatility as we see not only more Space Marines Warlords, but also as we see additional Tau, Space Marines, and Astra Militarum unique units. As with any attachment in either dire circumstances or simply if the situation happens to call for it, it is fully possible for you to use the Tau event Even the Odds to transfer this attachment between eligible characters, but until we see a much wider pool of eligible units, although it's always good to be aware of corner case uses such as that one, Despite being able to move attachments between planets, that's not necessarily one that I can see happening anytime soon. But moving ever onward, next up we have another unique card, this time a support in the Fortress Monastery, which for a cost of one has the location trait and the limited keyword. And just to remind you, each player is restricted to only being able to play one limited card per round. And additionally, the Fortress Monastery has the text interrupt. When you deploy a Space Marines unit, exhaust this support to reduce that unit's cost by one. So obviously this is a very cheap support and as soon as you're able to deploy even a single Space Marines unit you're able to effectively refund the cost required to play this support in the first place. Particularly as our card pool does expand it's going to always be important to keep an eye on that limited restriction and considering that there's only a finite number of game rounds, you're likely to find yourself really scratching your head when it comes to how many copies to consider including in your deck. You can only ever have one of these in play at the same time, and considering that each game lasts an absolute maximum of seven rounds, certainly if you only draw this inconsistently, you're unlikely to see the same potentially very significant benefit you might if you end up drawing this on turn one or turn two, which is all the more likely to happen the more copies of this you bother to include in your deck. Important to note is that with any Space Marines card that allows you to circumvent conventional deployment, whether it's the ambush keyword, an event we'll cover shortly, or the action of veteran brother Maxos, you do not get the opportunity to trigger this support. And furthermore, it's important to consider that it has to exhaust in order to trigger that beneficial effect. So even though this pays for itself quickly, it could nevertheless be a dead card if you include multiple copies in your deck. And although this ability can prove to be a significant benefit, there are certainly going to be games where you find yourself frustrated by this attachment. So at the moment, it might see play simply because we don't have a ton of other options, and it can potentially prove to be a reasonably valuable effect, but it's a damn shame that it doesn't happen to have any shield icons, and this certainly strikes me as a bit of a mixed bag of a support. 
But our second and final Space Marine support card is the two-cost Holy Sepulcher, with the location trait and reaction. After a Space Marine's unit enters your discard pile from play, exhaust this support to return that unit to your hand. So, although it has the same restriction of needing to exhaust as does the Fortress Monastery, this has the entirely dissimilar effect of returning destroyed or defeated Space Marines units back to your hand. And as with any kind of recursive effect, this allows players the opportunity to potentially run a greater diversity of units in their deck, but fewer individual copies of each of those units. Just because if you're able to play some of those and then return them to your hand when they're destroyed, it functions in a similar sense to drawing multiple copies of those cards. Although the strength of a deck certainly relies on a strong and consistent foundation, given that eventually we're going to have nine different factions and innumerable different warlords in this game, if you find yourself frequently playing against opponents that are going to be playing an unknown faction and unknown warlord, that increased diversity could nevertheless prove ultimately beneficial, even if it does force you into less consistent draw. It is a bit of an investment at two resources, but given that at the moment only the Orcs player has any ability to remove supports from play, this has the potential of returning a large number of units back to your hand. And given that some of the Space Marine units, like Honored Librarian or Blood Angels Veterans, can be very stubborn to remove from play in the first place, being able to put them back onto the table can be enormously frustrating for your opponent. And the same thing goes with units that you can deploy by surprise, such as the Eager Recruit with his Ambush keyword, or even simply cheap units like our 10th Company Scout. Really, the options for this card are limitless. And although with the exception of Sicarius's Chosen, we haven't seen any When Enters Play type effects on units, the ability to simply return a destroyed unit back into play could easily prove invaluable. It's worth noting again that only Space Marine units are eligible to be targeted by this ability, but nevertheless, this support seems to have fantastic potential and is sure to be a Space Marine staple for quite a while to come. While we are on the topic of staple Space Marine cards, the first of our trio of events is Drop Pod Assault, with a cost of two, two shield icons, the tactic trait, and a loyal icon. It reads Combat Action. Target a planet where a battle is taking place. Search the top six cards of your deck for a Space Marines unit with printed cost three or lower. Put that unit into play at the targeted planet and place the remaining cards on the bottom of your deck in any order. So, just like we covered with the Eager Recruits and Veteran Brother Maxos, this card has the fantastic potential of surprising your opponent at the most opportune of times. It's relatively inexpensive at a cost of two, but beyond that has the potential of saving you a resource in allowing you to put an up to three cost Space Marine unit directly into play. Not only does your opponent miss out on the opportunity to leverage deploy actions against you, but because you can again use action windows to your benefit, it's quite possible that you could put a very hard-hitting, or potentially extraordinarily resilient, Space Marine unit into play at the tail end of combat once all of your opponent's units are exhausted. This could allow you to opportunistically snipe and destroy some sort of valuable units, or in any case put some potential pain in the ass into play against your opponent. 
Really, the only problem with this card is that it is possible that in the top six cards of your deck, you might end up drawing something that's less than optimal, like a 10th Company Scout, or you might whiff entirely, just in case you don't happen to see any Space Marine army units. But of course, that's something you want to take into consideration when you're building your deck in the first place. And the Space Marines player at the present moment certainly has a whole host of different three or lower cost units to pick from. Just like any ambush unit, it's entirely possible that you can leverage action windows to steal the first planet into your victory display. If your opponent doesn't end up committing or deploying any units whatsoever to that planet, and if you happen to be one of those frustrating players trying to get the absolute utmost effect out of your honored librarian, right at the moment where your opponent thinks they've finally whittled away your last units and have finally opened up your librarian to become eligible for attacks, you can play your drop pot assault to put yet another army unit onto the battlefield between your opponent and your four attack librarian. At the very least, this card has enormous shield value, and as with so many other cards, the element of surprise can make an incredible difference as to the outcome of not just an individual combat, but the next turn's command struggle and any number of additional battles. Again worth mentioning is that since this doesn't count as deploying a unit, you aren't able to trigger the interrupt effect of Fortress Monastery, so in that case you don't actually benefit from any resource reduction effect, but considering you can only benefit from that support once per turn anyways, that's unlikely to end up making any difference at all. Certainly, if your opponent is holding the initiative token, the inherent unpredictability of this card not only for your enemy, but also for you, can make this a little risky to play, but depending on what you draw, you nevertheless might be able to survive an initial volley of fire after you squeeze in your first surprise attack, and if instead you're the one holding that initiative token, depending on which unit you put into play, you could at the very least deliver a pair of possibly devastating strikes against your opponent. Plus, last but not least, even if you're so unlucky as to have this event whiff entirely, and you're entirely unable to actually put a Space Marines unit into play, you nevertheless have the opportunity to look at those top six cards and rearrange them, albeit at the bottom of your deck, in whatever order you choose. And if the game is going long, or you have an enormous amount of card advantage, it's nevertheless very possible that you could benefit from that rearrangement. So certainly you'll always want to put your most valuable upcoming cards near the top, but in any case, even if you're not going to be able to dig through your deck, you nevertheless have all the more information than you did about what cards are likely to make their way into your hand. Next, we have the iconic Space Marine event, Exterminatus. With a cost of three, one shield icon, the tactic trait, and the text deploy action. Destroy all non-unique units at a target non-first planet. So, potentially more than any other, this card has the inherent possibility of absolutely obliterating your opponent's entire army, and through its ability can destroy a literally infinite number of units, even if it's possible for some of yours to get caught in the crossfire. But, even though this has the potential of eliminating your opponent's entirely army, being able to pick off even a single, extremely expensive enemy unit can nevertheless make this card worth its value alone. Worth noting, however, is that anyone running up against a Tau, Space Marine, or Astra Militarum player is going to be trying to deploy units and commit their Warlord in a way that they can try and dodge this event. 
And if it just so happens that your opponent is deploying and committing heavily to the first planet, avoiding playing expensive units or simply distributing their units relatively equally throughout the battlefield, it could be very difficult to find an ideal target for this event. But nevertheless, it is certainly something that your opponent has to play around and whether or not you include it in your deck, you can use the fear of this event in your favor, particularly if you happen to have three or more resources during the deploy action phase, especially if it seems like you're delaying some large resource cost action. Seeing as how you have to play this before the command phase, if you can wait long enough to deploy it, it's possible that you can deny your opponent cards and resources by clearing out some of their command icon units, and if you distribute your army throughout the board, that can potentially serve to lure your opponent away from the first planet. It's entirely possible, given your choice of Warlord, that you might use a card like Sicarius's Chosen in order to peel expensive enemy units into a trap so that you can deploy this card and derive as much economic gain as possible, and certainly if you do happen to destroy some of your own units with this card, you might benefit all the more from having Holy Sepulchre in play. So, while this may not always work out for you, it nevertheless does possess the potential to be devastating, and if you can force your opponent away from committing to the first planets, particularly if you can manage to catch their warlord's retinue with this event, it's possible that you can deal an utterly crippling blow. And if under some circumstance you're able to bloody your enemy warlord, it's probably all the more likely that they're going to try and avoid combat with you at any cost. So there are certainly countless situations where Exterminatus could be great. There are maybe even more situations where it won't be, but in any case, it certainly poses a significant threat to your enemy. And even if it ends up conferring to you a marginal benefit, it just might be worth including in your deck and playing. Plus, if it just so happens that you're running up against opponents that frequently employ flying units, or run units like the Stalwart Ogren or Honored Librarian that are difficult to pin down or target by ordinary means, Exterminatus can prove all the more valuable, especially if you've instilled a sense of false confidence in your opponent in leveraging a very nasty surprise against them. And even if it seems like it's going to be nothing more than a dead card in your hand, at the absolute least, it nevertheless does possess that one shield value. So, to conclude our trio of what have the potential to be enormously powerful Space Marine events, last we have Indomitable. With a cost of one, one shield icon, the power trait, and no loyal icon, and reaction. After a Space Marine unit is assigned damage by an attack, prevent all of that damage. So, just like Iron Halo, but instead essentially invisible as an event in your hand, Indomitable entirely negates a single attack directed toward any Space Marine unit. Whether it happens to be an army or your warlord, whether it happens to be a paltry attack power of one, up to or exceeding an enormous attack of eight. Even if you happen to be running up against an Eldar player with multiple copies of Ion Rifle affixed to an Iandan Wraith Guard, leveraging Armor Bane against your Warlord for one single resource, you can cancel the effects of that attack entirely, which can not only spare your Warlord from being bloodied, but has the potential of routing and utterly countering your opponent's most carefully laid of plans. It's entirely possible that your opponent may have been risking everything just to score a bloodying or kill against your warlord, and if you can spend no more than a single resource token to throw all of that hard work away, 
this single event could easily cost your opponent the game. Taking that Eandon Wraithguard example, for instance, your opponent could have invested any number of cards and resources into a single action that they were hoping would win them the game. But if you're able to counter that, you could easily deal a devastating blow in return by destroying that unit and costing your opponent countless cards and resources. This card is not limited, it's not limit once per deck, and although it does not work for anything apart from attacks, leaving your units just as exposed to area effect and other things as they ever are, there are exceptionally few counters to this. An Eldar player might be able to play Nullify, so long as they have a ready unique unit, but if they don't, even that enormously powerful card may, in that situation, do absolutely nothing to save them. Plus, if for some reason you find yourself with absolutely no resources whatsoever, it's entirely possible that you might opt to use this card for its shield icon, Maybe if you're lucky enough to draw multiple copies, or maybe if you're winning by such a wide margin that you just don't care anymore, but in any case, in almost any number of circumstances, this card is absolutely amazing and could single-handedly easily alter the outcome of a game. Quite possibly the only downfall of this card to be aware of is that when your opponent attacks you, damage is resolved in a three-step process. You assign damage equal to the attacking unit's attack value, the defender has the opportunity to use a shield card of any value, and then finally, you assign a number of damage tokens to the defending unit equal to the number of assigned damage minus the number of shield icons played to protect that unit. If you happen to have Indomitable in your hand, but opt instead to use a shield card to protect whatever unit is attacked, if your opponent triggers no mercy in order to cancel that shield card, you've passed your opportunity to play this reaction in response to that assignment of damage. So if you're trying to be conservative with these events, it is possible, although likely to be exceedingly rare to occur, that you could potentially lose a valuable unit that Indomitable could have easily saved. But apart from that single corner case, this is an immensely powerful event. The fact that it's not loyal or limited and has no restrictions whatsoever is absolutely fantastic. And for that reason, any deck that's making use of a large number of Space Marine units should seriously consider including up to the maximum number of allowable copies of this event in their deck. I think one final, funny use for this card worth mentioning might be on the Honored Librarian, particularly in a situation when your opponent has had to chew through countless other units in order to finally open a window of opportunity to attack that frustratingly invulnerable unit, only to be shut down yet again at the last minute by one or more copies of Indomitable. But now that we've finally covered the last of our Space Marine faction cards, that brings this video to a close. So, as always, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to this channel if you have not done so already. If I missed some of your favorite uses for any of these cards, or you have any of your own particularly clever or devious tips and tricks that you love to leverage against your opponent, be sure to let me know in the comments below, or if you have any game experiences you'd like to share, whether it's a dominating victory or a crushing defeat, I love to hear from veteran players. But with that said, thank you once again, and I'll see you again soon.